What's up, everybody? My name's Parasite. Welcome to How to MLS with Sporting Kansas City. This is not going to be your traditional MLS tutorial where I'll tell you how it works and send you on your way. This is going to be more of a walkthrough where I'll tell you how it works, but I'll also show you how it works. I'll go through an MLS season. I'll sign players. I'll waive players. I'll trade players and show you that the MLS isn't quite as foreboding, or really as complicated as it might seem on first look. There's a lot of rules, obviously. It's I mean, even from the league structure to the registration, there's a lot more rules than a traditional European league. But I don't know if that's necessarily a bad thing. It makes it a little tougher. I mean, players like you or I that have probably played a lot of football manager are pretty decent at the game. Sometimes we need a challenge because traditional European leagues can get a little easy. This provides a challenge. And I think it almost makes building the MLS roster more gratifying because you have to buy each player with their specific role in mind. You can't just go buy all the best young players in the world and train them to be world-class players and have them on your team. And it doesn't work like that. You have to have specific roles for specific players and be smart about how you build a team. You have to put more thought process into it. And I like that. So let's get into the registration information. This is the first thing you should look at when you join an MLS club, this MLS contract and registration information. I suggest you go to it and save it as a note because it's good to come back and look on if you need any more updates on how the contracts work. If you're not exactly sure how much they'll count towards the cap, it'll help you out a lot. But some of it is a little bit more complicated than it really needs to be. I feel like it's not written perfectly. Hopefully I can explain it a little bit better and hopefully showing you how it works will make you understand it a little bit better. But this is the most important place to start right here. There are two main types of squad registration slots in the MLS senior and off-budget players. Basically, players registered on a senior slot will always count towards the salary cap, but you can sign a maximum of 20 senior players. Off-budget players do not count against the salary cap, but you can only sign a total of 10 off-budget players. And so that leads to a full maximum squad size of 30 players, 20, off, 20 senior, 10 off-budget. We'll start with senior players. There are two main types of senior players. You have the Traditional senior players and designated players, something you might have heard of, but there's a little bit of difference between the two. The basically the main difference is senior players, their wage, whatever wage you pay them, is what they count towards against the salary cap. So if you pay them for a three hundred thousand dollar a year contract, and I will be using yearly contracts because that's how it works in the MLS. If you pay them three hundred thousand dollars a year, their salary cap hit is going to be three hundred thousand dollars with one exception. You can actually buy down salary cap impact on senior, traditional senior players. So let's go to one. I think Luis Martins, his contract can be bought down. He is on a senior contract. He's being paid $340,000 a week, um, a year. So that's what will go towards his, to the salary cap. But you can do this thing called buying down the salary cap where you use general allocation money, which is, if you go to league specific, this, a little bit of money that the league gives you every year. It says 2.6 available at season start. It's going to be different every year. There's a lot of different caveats and how that works. I'm not going to get all of those because it's a little complicated and it doesn't need to be. Basically, whatever you get, you can use that money to trade, which is obviously a new thing in the MLS, and you can use it to buy down contracts. So if you go back to Luis Martins, we said his cap hit is 340K a year. We can go down the contract and buy down the salary cap impact and use that general allocation money to make his cap hit up to half the wage. So say he's being paid $340,000 a year, his salary cap impact can go down as much as $170,000 a year. So you can buy down his salary cap impact to half of what it, his wage is. And you can do that with any senior player. So if we go to the squad and the registration, uh, for, like Graham Zusa here is a senior player. His wage is $713,000. His cap impact now is $248,000, but that's because he's been at the club for a long time. So it's been bought down quite a bit, but you can register him and he'll take up a senior spot, which just adds to your maximum of 30 players. But you'll see the maximum squad salary go from 1.22 to 1.47. That is the $248,000 being added to the salary cap. But you also have designated players. So those are players like Johnny Russell and Polito here. There are two designated players of the team. You can have a maximum of three, but you see their wage is 2.2 million. 
but their salary cap impact is not $2.2 million. That's because they're signed using a designated player slot, which any player signed using a designated player slot will count $613,000 against the cap if they're 24 years or older. There are basically three different prices that they can count towards the salary cap, all depending on their age, actually four. So 24 or older, they count as $613,000 against the salary cap. If they're bought in the summer transfer window, so the August transfer window, their salary cap impact, I believe, is $306,000, so half of what they get traditionally. If you're 21 to 23 years old, your salary cap impact is $200,000. And if you're 20 years or younger, your salary cap impact is $150,000. Again, that's no matter what your wage is. You can be paid as much as the team wants, as much as their wage budget allows, because you still have wage budgets. You might have salary caps, but you also have wage budgets. You might be wondering here why we already have 1.22 million counted towards the salary cap. That's because no matter if they're registered or not, designated players count towards your salary cap. So you need to make sure if you have a designated player, he is registered and he is a big part of your team because they should be your best players at your team. So see if we register them, the salary cap impact does not go up because they are being paid that no matter whether they're registered or not. They count towards the designated players, they count to the maximum squad size. But that's it. So that is senior players. Those are going to be the main players you build around. Those are going to be the better players traditionally in your team. But there's also the 10 off-budget players. Like I said, these players don't count towards the salary cap. So a player like, uh, let's find him, Graham Smith here is an off-budget player. If we, if we register him, he goes towards the off-budget players. So there are four main types of off-budget players. You have Players like Graham Smith here who are classified as a senior minimum salary player. That is the contract type that you sign them on. You know, just like in a traditional leagues where you sign them to full-time or part-time. In the MLS, it's different. There's senior minimum salary, senior, reserve, designated player. There's different kinds of contracts you can sign them on. Senior minimum salary players, let's say here, his, his squad status is senior minimum salary. They can only be paid $81,500 a year. Every single senior minimum salary player is getting paid that exact same amount of money, no matter who they are. But since they're an off-budget player, they don't count towards the salary cap. So that's the advantage of signing those players. You can only sign a maximum of four of those, I believe. Well, depending on if they're homegrown or not. You can sign a maximum of four non-reserve, which means senior minimum salary, and non-homegrown. So if you have some in senior minimum salary, Reserve players, like or uh, senior minimum salary players, like I think we have one. We don't have one. If we did, I'd show you, but they would count towards off budget, but they wouldn't count towards this kind of senior minimum salary cap. You traditionally don't have that many senior minimum salary players that are also homegrown. So for the most part, it's only going to be four senior minimum salary players. The other main type of off budget player is the reserve player. These are traditionally your younger players that are paid the least, they are paid $63,500 a year. They can only be signed on reserve contracts if they're 24 years old or younger. And like I said, just like senior minimum salary, they are all paid this one set wage and they don't count towards the salary cap. So you like Jake Davis, he's a reserve player. He counts towards the off budget and he counts towards reserve players. And you can have a maximum of four non-homegrown reserve players. So Jake Davis is homegrown, so he counts, he does not count towards that. Do we have any non-homegrown reserve players? I don't think we do just yet. I probably will be signing some as the season goes on. So they'll add to this list here. So that's just something you have to consider. If they're homegrown or not, you can only have four of them. So, But if they are homegrown, still the maximum you can have is six reserve players. I know it seems a little complicated, but as I show you how it works, hopefully you'll understand it a little bit better. That'll mostly be in the next episode where I'll actually put this into use. I'll start signing players. I'll start registering players. And then you can really look at how it works in action. So those are the two main types of off-budget players. But there's another two other types. So the first one, one of which we have, one of which we don't. Daniel Saloui here, you'll see he's on a senior contract making $457,000 a year. Salary cap impact is $147,000. But he counts as an off-budget player. And he does not count towards the salary cap. That is because he is homegrown. And he counts towards the homegrown player's subsidy which is basically any homegrown player whose salary cap impact is 
$125,000 above the senior minimum salary or less. So he's being paid $147,000. That's his cap impact, which is less than $125,000 more than the senior minimum salary. So he technically counts, even though he's on a senior contract, he counts as an off-budget player. So his, his $147,000 does not go against the salary cap. So those players are really nice to have. But again, they have to be homegrown. They have to be, for the most part, they have to be young because their salary cap impact can only be so large. So Shallowy counts towards that, and Jalen Lindsay here counts towards that. You'll see they both are added to the off-budget players, and the maximum squad salary is still at $1.22 million. That is the third main type of off-budget player. The fourth type, which we don't have any to show you right now, but hopefully after the MLS draft, we can show you one because these are players typically only gotten through the MLS draft. They are generation Adidas players. These players are off-budget players, but they can be paid more than the senior minimum salary. So they don't have to be homegrown. They can be, this could be their first year at the club. But if they're designated as a Generation Adidas, which are the best players that come out of the draft, they're registered as Generation Adidas for the length of their basically rookie contract. So the first contract they're given, which is a maximum of three years, they can be qualified as Senior Adidas and make more than a senior minimum salary and don't count towards the salary cap. So those could be some really good young players that, I mean, they might not be good enough to be first team players, but they could be squad players that, you get for they could be really good young players that you can get for pretty cheap but having no salary cap impact is huge is so valuable so they can count towards your 10 off budget players and that's basically how the registration rules work it sounds complicated but once you actually start getting into it and see it firsthand it's not that complicated so let's just register the squad we've gotten out this isn't going to be the squad we use in the end because i'll need to sign players i'll probably need to waive players but players we're definitely going to keep. Johnny Russell, our designated player, he stays. He gets ad added as one of the designated players of the squad. He goes towards the squad salary. Obviously, the squad salary doesn't change because he's a designated player. They already count towards the squad salary. But he's added to the maximum of 30 players. Same for Alan Polito. He's also added to the maximum of seven internationals. You can have up to eight international players in your 30-man squad. But you can also sell or buy international slots. I don't think you can go above eight, but you can go anywhere below it. So we can have one international slot. We could sell all of them, but you can either sell them permanently, which teams usually don't do, or you can sell them for a set period of time in some sort of trade. So like we currently only have seven. We have traded away our eighth international slot. So we can have a maximum of seven players that aren't partially American. So Polito counts as that. He's Mexican. So he counts as an international. Daddy Kinda here is one of our better senior players. He counts as an international. And you'll see he counts towards the squad salary. He's not a designated player, though, so he doesn't count towards that. Same for Poonchech. Goes to the salary cap. Goes towards international players. Goes towards the squad size. Ismet Mirin, the same. Luis Martins is not uh, foreign. He actually has American nationality. So he does not count as an international. But he does count towards the maximum squad salary. He counts towards the salary cap because he is a senior player on a senior contract with a salary cap impact of 340k, which we can buy down and probably will. But I'll show you that later. So he counts towards the salary cap and the squad size. Remy Walter, another senior player on an international contract. Same for Fontas. Sanchez is part has American nationality, so he won't count towards the internationals, but he still his Salary cap impact of 250k is added to the squad salary, so it'll see it'll go up to 256 or 356. Mary, another international senior player, Zusi, a senior player, Shelton, Espinoza, Melia, and Dia. Those are all your senior players. So once we add them all up, our salary cap hit is 4.79 million dollars out of a maximum of 4.9. So we're pretty close to the salary cap. Everyone else is going to count as an off-budget player. Those are our senior players currently at the squad. We have 15 of them. You can have a maximum of 20, but you can have anywhere below 20 you want to as well, but with a minimum of 18 total players. You usually want more than that, though. So these are our off-budget players. So 
Cisneros here is a reserve player that is homegrown, so he will count towards the reserve. He will not count towards non-reserve. He'll count towards the off-budget, and he'll count towards the maximum squad size. Jake Davis, also a reserve, homegrown. Graham Smith is a senior minimum salary, so he will count towards the off-budget, the non-reserve, non-homegrown off-budget, because he's not homegrown. I think that's all. Yes. So he, get, he counts towards those for the team and towards the squad size, but not towards the squad salary because he's an off-budget player. Saloui is one of those homegrown player subsidy players that is on a senior contract, but he counts as off-budget. So his only thing he adds to is the off-budget players. He's not a reserve player. He's not a senior minimum salary player. So he just counts solely as an off-budget and towards the squad size. Same with Jalen Lindsay here. The rest of these players are all reserve players, except for Kendall McIntosh. He's a senior minimum salary, so he counts towards off-budget. He counts towards the non-reserve, non-homegrown off-budget. And then the rest of them are reserve. Can we fit them all in? We can. There's the rest of our reserve players, making a maximum of 10 off-budget players. We have a maximum of 6 reserve players. And we have 2 of the 4 non-reserve, non-homegrown off-budget players. So that is the MLS squad that you get day one with Sporting Kansas City. They're able to be registered. They fill all the slots, have the 10 maximum off budget, which I do suggest to always have 10 off budget players because they don't count towards the salary cap. So they're not going to be your best players for the most part, but they're always going to be useful squad players that are basically like loaning players on a free. They count towards your wage budget, but what you really need to focus on is the salary cap in the MLS and they don't count towards that. So they're very, very good to have around. So that is the registration. All next, like I said, next episode I'm going to go through registering players. I'm actually going to keep at the club. All these players aren't going to be registered. Some of them will be loaned out. Some of them might be waived. Some of them might be traded if I can, or sold. And I'm going to definitely sign players because we only have two of three designated players. And traditionally, you want as many designated players as you can have. The maximum you can have is three. So I want three designated players. Because they are the best players at the club. So I'm just almost handicapping myself by not getting a really good player. But I still have to work him into the squad salary. Because he is going to count towards the maximum squad salary. I have this $613,000 if he's 24 or older. So I need to make room. But I think I need to bring in a designated player. Finally, we're going to talk about the league-specific rules. How the league's set up. How the playoffs work. How Champions League qualification works. So... In the MLS, there's two conferences, the Eastern and the Western. There's currently 14 teams in the Eastern and only 13 in the Western. But next year, I believe it's Charlotte FC is going to be joining the MLS. They're actually going to join the Eastern and Nashville are going to move to the Western. So each will be at 14 teams. In terms of the schedule, right now, because there's different amount of teams in each conference, it's a little complicated. Like you'll face, traditionally, you'll face every team in your conference twice. But because of the way things are set this year, we play like FC Dallas three times, one home, one away. And then the, I think the other we got is away, just randomly, whether the third is away or home. And we play like two or three Eastern Conference player, Eastern, Eastern Conference teams. But starting in 2022, once both leagues are at 14 teams in each, it's going to be simple. You play every team in your conference twice, once home, once away. And then you play eight teams from the other conference, four of them at home, four of them away, each one randomly selected each season. So we're going to play eight Eastern Conference teams next season. Four of them at home, four of them away. And that's your maximum of 34 games. So in terms of that, it's not very complicated. In terms of the playoff, which is something a little bit different than traditional European leagues and might be one of the things that kind of scare you away, but it's actually really simple. You have seven... Uh, slots that get into the playoffs from each conference. So first through seventh in the Eastern and Western Conference qualify for the playoffs. First place from the conference qualifies for the second round of the playoffs, the semifinal. They don't have to play in the first round because they won their conference. But second through seventh play in the first round of the Western Conference or Eastern Conference playoffs. You only play your division in the playoffs until you get to the MLS Cup. MLS Cup. So start off with the Western Conference first round. So second place faces seventh, third places sixth, and fourth goes against fifth. The winners go on to the semifinal where the lowest seeded team 
goes up against the team that had the bye, the number one team in the conference. The winner of that goes on to the conference final. And obviously the winner of that from each conference goes on to the MLS Cup. So the two best teams that end up at each conference go on to face in the MLS Cup. The winner of that basically wins the MLS. That is the main championship you're looking for. The main trophy you're going to be looking to win is the MLS Cup. But you also have this thing called the Supporter Shield, which is should be pretty understandable to most fans from European teams because it's just a traditional league table. A combined league table of both conferences, 27 teams. Whoever has the most points at the end wins the Supporter Shield. You win a trophy, and you get qualification to the CONCACAF Champions League first round. So the winner of the Supporter Shield wins that. The other qualifiers, there are a total of four. The other qualifiers are the winners of the Western and the Eastern Conference Final. So technically the winner of the MLS Cup also goes, but the winner of the MLS Cup is either going to be the winner of the Eastern or Western Conference. So yeah, the winner of either of that goes, and the winner of the Cup, the Lamar Hunt U.S. Open Cup, the winner of the Cup also gets qualified for the first round of the CONCACAF Champions League. If two of those teams are the two of those winners are the same team, so say if we win the Eastern Conference Final and we win the Cup, the next highest finisher in the Supporter Shield is the qualifier for the CONCACAF Champions League. So if let's say like this, Austin FC finished second, and we Atlanta finishes first, but they also win the Western Conference, or they they're in the Eastern, they win the Eastern Conference, then Austin will get the fourth uh, champ, CONCACAF Champions League spot. So that's how that works. And that's basically it. That's all the complicated bit of the MLS. The league structure and the registration rules. Everything else, you play like a traditional European team. Two home, two away. All that stuff. Like Finances are they have their own league-specific thing where it shows your transfer funds. So you do get a transfer budget to buy players from abroad. You can't use transfer funds to buy MLS players. You can only use general allocation money or you can trade international slots or stuff like that. You have your league salary cap. Target allocation money, I don't know if we'll talk about it because it's not really used very well in the game. So you typically won't really have to worry about target allocation money, but you also have a wage budget. So see, our wage budget is $18.2 million a year. Most of that is going to our designated player because you can only spend so much for the rest of your team. But you do have a wage budget you have to follow as well as a salary cap. So, I again, it might sound complicated. Hopefully tomorrow when I put it into practice, it'll make a little bit more sense. Hopefully I was able to explain it a little bit decently well at least today. So you kind of make more sense of it than maybe you had going in. So that's basically it for the MLS. That's all the complicated things that really the MLS has that's different from a traditional European league. It might seem a little complex still just for me telling you about it. That's why I'm also going to show you show you how it works. Hopefully, like next episode, we're going to start actually building our squad. And hopefully that'll start to make more sense because you really just need to pay more attention to the kind of players you sign, what you know, registration slots they occupy, whether they're an international, whether they're non-reserve, non-homegrown, whether they're non-reserve, non-homegrown reserve, you'll know when you sign them what they what they qualify for just by looking at the player. You'll know if they're international, obviously. You'll know what kind of contract you can sign them on. Like if you go to sign them, you'll know the contract that you can give them. And you just have to you might have to lose out on some players because they won't sign for your senior minimum salary. They want to be a senior contract, but you don't have the salary cap space. It's not going to be perfect. You can't sign every player you want. But again, I like the challenge. I like the challenge it brings. So we'll go through a season or two or three. I don't know how long we're going to go. Basically until I feel like I've explained it well and we kind of get, hopefully you all have a good idea of how to play as an MLS club. And hopefully after watching this, you'll decide to play as an MLS club because I think it's fun. It looks complicated, but, and it is restrictive, but I think it's fun. It just adds more challenge to the game. That's not a bad thing. Hopefully you've learned something today, but that's going to be the end of this episode. If you made it this far, why don't you like the video, subscribe, and click the bell. The links to all my socials and my Twitch are in the description. I really appreciate all your support. Thank you all for joining me, and I'll see you next time.